Welcome. As the last few of you are uh, signing on the extra credit chapel sheet and uh, finding spots, there are a few seats up here, some there, some there. Um, yeah, so look around, uh, fill in the spaces. Um, thanks for coming out tonight, uh, students and pastors. Uh, you, uh, we are continuing tonight our series on commemorating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Uh, so uh, students are here, uh, some pastors are here, and we're glad that you're here to, uh, in particular tonight, to consider John Calvin and his part of the Reformation, in particular uh, how it still influences our world today. Uh, uh, in a moment, Dr. Ian Clary is going to come up and introduce our speaker for tonight, but I just wanted to uh, remind you, actually that reminds me, um, Ian and Michael, would you be willing to uh, grab hold of the, uh, these and hand them out to the students? You've probably got it before, but why don't we hand them out to you and you can have another look at it. Uh, this is the schedule of, of events for our Reformation commemoration. And we've, we've had a number of events already. Some of you have been to them. We had, um, uh, we've had a, uh, one talk in chapel by Dr. Cotter introducing our School of Theology focus on the Reformation this year. Uh, next, is it uh, next week? Uh, Professor Plato, that you'll be in chapel, or is it the week following? Professor Plato? What, is it next week or the week after that you're speaking in chapel? Week after. week after, okay. So he'll be continuing our focus on the sola, sola scriptura. Uh, but as well, next week well, there is an additional event, and that is uh, our CCU history professors will we'll be having a panel discussion on the Reformation over at uh, the library. So that'll be happening a week from today. It's actually an afternoon event. It'll be happening at uh, 4 o'clock, or I'm sorry, 4.30 uh, next Tuesday. So we'll be looking for that. Actually, that will also be an extra credit chapel opportunity. So you seniors who are desperately trying to uh, uh, fulfill your requirement, uh, that would be another chance for you to uh, get an extra credit chapel next Tuesday. CCU history professors at the library. Some of you were here for two weeks ago when uh, Dr. Michael Haken spoke on women of the Reformation. Uh, for those of you that are here, you were, you were blessed by, by that talk. Uh, <clears throat> and going forward, one thing I, I really want to encourage you to consider going to this weekend is this Sunday. Now, that's a change. As you look at the schedule here, there's a change. Originally, uh, this Friday was going to be a presentation of... Uh, one-act student plays. These are written by students here at CCU and performed by them and with Reformation themes called Reforming Love. And that was going to be this Friday, but it had to be switched because of our homecoming activities. But it will be occurring this Sunday at 4 over in the Music Center. So please consider going to that. There's no charge for it. Of course, for your students, there never is. But 4 o'clock this sun Sunday, Reforming Love. It's a festival of student one-act plays based on Reformation themes. So Hold on to this. Look at it. Use it for reference. We want to encourage you to be involved uh, with these events as much as possible. Tonight's event in particular is, as I said, focusing on John Calvin, but we do have some other guests in the room, uh, local pastors. And for you local pastors, uh, before you leave tonight, make sure you get this gift uh, from CCU. Uh, this is a book, a very new book, caught off the presses for tonight's, uh, tonight's speaker, Dr. Mark Jones. Uh, this is his new book on faith, hope, and love, the Christ-centered way to grow in grace. I think you'll find this a very helpful book, and if you'd like, Dr. Jones would be glad to sign it for you afterwards as well. So please, pastors who are in the room, make sure to come up front uh, when we're done tonight and uh, get your copy, and uh, uh, also uh, meet uh, Dr. Jones if you'd like. So I'm going to lead us in prayer now. Then Dr. Clary will introduce Dr. Jones. He's going to give his talk on uh, Calvin and the ongoing effects of the Reformation. And then he will be glad to field any questions, probably related to the talk, but any questions you have for him tonight, uh, he'd be glad to uh, interact with you on that. So as he's talking and a question arises, please uh, make note of it yourself and then be ready to ask it when the Q&A time comes. All right, would you join me in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for... Uh, the joy of being able to come to, to you together because of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the chance to commemorate uh, the amazing events that, that, took, that were kicked off almost exactly 500 years ago that, whose, whose, whose effects reverberate even 
uh, until today. So Lord, help us as we consider the faithfulness of those who have gone before and recognize their impact on our lives to likewise have a vision to glorify you in our day and to leave a legacy for the generations that follow. So Lord, bless our time tonight. Bless our speaker, Dr. Jones, tonight. Use him in each one of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it is awesome to see how many people have come out tonight. I'm, I'm really encouraged seeing all of your faces. Um, it's going to be a great uh, discussion that we're going to have about the life of Calvin. And I'm especially happy uh, to have uh, as our speaker a friend of mine, <clears throat> a fellow Canadian. So we're having a sort of a subtle takeover of campus here. Um, Dr. Mark Jones. Uh, Mark is a pastor. He's a theologian. Uh, and he is an author. And uh, I think that you're going to be in for a real treat tonight. Uh, Mark is pastor of Faith Vancouver Presbyterian Church in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, he is the husband to Barb, and they have four children, two boys of which are twins. So you can imagine uh, how fun their home is. And uh, Mark um, is somebody who travels the world uh, wanting to just sh build up the church, uh, teaching Christ. Christians in places as far away as China, Brazil, South Korea, and his um, birthplace of South Africa. Um, so Mark is the author of a number of books. The one you just saw Dr. Wind advertise here called Faith, Hope, Love, which literally has just been released. You're probably the first people to actually set eyes on it, uh, which is pretty cool. And he's authored other books from popular to scholarly levels, um, books like a kind of a classic named Knowing Christ, and uh, uh, other works on the relationship of the law and the Christian faith. And then he studied uh, thinkers of the past, uh, like English Puritans, such as Thomas Goodwin. Uh, so I'm very happy to have Mark here as a friend and as a scholar and as a pastor. So brother, please come. Well, I'm very thankful for the fact that you're getting credit tonight and <laughs> that Ian uh, introduced me with uh, what will one day be my obituary, so uh, thank you. I um, was given a topic and uh, I must confess to you immediately, I'm not a, I'm not a scholar, uh, I'm a pastor who likes to dabble in these types of things, so which is good news for you, really, because generally the better the scholar, the more boring the talk. Uh, so I'm going to just aim low and um, given that I don't actually see a lot of scholars here tonight, I'm uh, feeling really good about this one. Um, the topic is Calvin's life and of course there's been biographies written ad nauseum ad infinitum uh, that'll be the only latin you'll hear tonight uh, on his life and i didn't really feel like uh, giving you a biography of calvin's life in a sort of beginning to end with all of the key points i thought i'd rather do the 10 points of calvinism which you're all familiar with um, under calvin's troubles so uh, it's kind of a depressing talk in some respects uh, because I'm just going to be looking at all of the sort of struggles that Calvin endured as a pastor in Geneva. Uh, and some of them are, are, are quite, uh, quite uh, moving, I think. Some are uh, going to relate to perhaps events that have taken place in your own life in a sort of uh, analogous way. And some will be very distant from you. So uh, you know that this is the 500-year anniversary and... Uh, we are, most of us here who are Protestants, I suppose, are, are happy about this, celebrating this, and yet we have to understand that the Reformation and all that it involved came at a great cost to those who were involved in the Reformation. Uh, it was far, far from easy, and it seems to me that when God chooses to use someone in a significant way over the course of church history— he ends up putting that person through intense struggles. Uh, you might think of Moses or Job or the Apostle Paul, and certainly with our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the same is true for his servants after the apostolic period. Those whom he uses in significant ways 
He crushes. He seems to, to beat them, as it were, into a type of mold where he can use them where they are utterly dependent upon him. And so as we go through these 10 points of, of Calvin's life, uh, I want you to consider that this is how God works when he works with his children and especially his esteemed servants. The first major problem that Calvin had to deal with in the Reformation were uh, problems from within. And what I mean by that is uh, among the Protestants, there were certain Protestants who went off in in dangerous directions regarding their theology, and you didn't have a monolithic group of reformers who all believed the same thing. You had some very intense theological debates among them and between them from the get-go, and Calvin had to deal with this. Um, some reformers, in fact, went back to Rome under increasing pressure in the towns and cities in which they lived. It was easier for them because of money, other circumstances, even preserving their own life, to go back to Rome. And there was this one man called Pierre Caroli. He was, by Calvin's estimation, a very difficult man to work with. And he wavered in his theological convictions. And uh, he was appointed the chief preacher in Lausanne. Uh, that's kind of a cool Reformation piece of history. They would have a chief preacher in each city. Uh, what Tim Keller might be to New York and John MacArthur to Los Angeles and in Seattle. Well, they don't really have one anymore. He left. Um, they would have chief preachers. And you can imagine that this would arouse a type of competitive spirit among the preachers to be known as the de facto chief preacher of the city. And uh, Carolee ended up saying that you could pray for the dead. He... Uh, would come up with all sorts of weird doctrines, and this set Calvin off. Not only because he thought that his friend uh, Pierre Viret should have been the chief preacher, but because of the false doctrine that emerged among some of the Protestants. Calvin uh, called uh, Carolee an ambitious man, a buffoon. And uh, when Viret left Lausanne, it was then that Caroli made accusations against Calvin and Viret, calling them Arians, which is to call them heretics. Well, uh, Calvin had to deal with the fact that he was being called a heretic, not only by the Roman Catholic Church, but also by certain Protestants. So the first major problem he had to deal with was problems from within. The second was purity in the church, as he's reforming the church, setting up the church. He wants to create a church in which there is moral purity. And in 1538, he wanted to withhold the Lord's Supper from the wicked. The problem was is that Calvin often didn't get his way. And the council, the political council in Geneva says, no, no, you have to offer it to everybody who comes. Calvin didn't like that. In fact, in 1546, there was another problem he had to deal with in the church, which I called the dancing fiasco. This was among Calvin's church members. There was a wedding in which the daughter of Antoine Lecht, uh, who was a prominent citizen, uh, they had dancing at the wedding, and this brought great disturbance. In fact, the participants were... Uh, saying that they had not, in fact, danced at the wedding, but Calvin knew they had danced at the wedding, and so he waited till Sunday when they all came to church after the wedding and thundered from the pulpit about how wicked and vile they were for dancing. In fact, he said that they should build their own city with their own rules. Uh, this is... Uh, part of Reformation life in Geneva, don't dance at a wedding. Um, and it's interesting the way they deal with uh, problems and trying to get people to be holy and get along. In fact, if you were a husband and wife in some of these Reformation towns and cities and you were having a dispute, they would take you up into a tower and give you bread and water until you resolved your dispute. Now, I have asked my elders to build a tower for that very purpose. Um, but can you imagine uh, being sent up with bread and water to resolve a dispute with your spouse? Um, you know, it's a very different age. 
against the libertines. A year later, they were those uh, people who were renowned for their wickedness and impurity. Uh, they came uh, to take the Lord's Supper, and uh, they came in not simply as human beings, but as human beings carrying swords. Uh, most of the time in early modern Reformation periods and after that, people would walk around and go to synods and theological debates with swords. Well, people would go to the Lord's Supper at church with swords, and Calvin put himself before the table facing the drawn swords of his enemies and said, if it is my life you desire, I am ready to die. If it is my banishment you wish, I shall exile myself. If you desire once more to save Geneva without the gospel, you can try. Calvin was willing to put his life on the line to protect the Lord's table from people who were openly wicked and unrepentant. So he had uh, purity in the church in which he had to deal with. Another interesting uh, event in Calvin's life was the training of new ministers. The first hurdle really for Calvin in Geneva was establishing clergy to take care of all of the different churches. Now, he says many were woefully inadequate to the job. And so from about 1541 to 1546, he oversaw the transformation of the ministry uh, in Zurich and Baal and Geneva. Um, you had uh, a lot of uh, Roman Catholic priests. When the town becomes Protestant, they say, well, I guess we're Protestant now. It wasn't necessarily because their convictions had changed. It was simply because the city became Protestant. They thought, well, if we want to keep our job, so to speak, we will become Protestants. And so Calvin draws up what we call ecclesiastical ordinances and makes the initial comment that Geneva was not overly blessed with talent. In fact, uh, not the greatest uh, introduction to the ministers in Geneva, but... Listen to this. Our colleagues are rather a hindrance than a help to us. They are rude and self-conceited, have no zeal and less learning. But worst of all, I cannot trust them, even though I very much wish that I could. For in many respects, they demonstrate their opposition to us and give little indication of a sincere and trustworthy disposition. I bear with them, however, I dread factions that arise from quarrels, but no one can complain I have been too severe. Uh, I suppose, uh, <laughs> rude and self-conceited, no zeal and less learning, uh, certainly not the type of uh, recommendation you'd want your professor giving you towards grad school. Um, but he tried to get them paid more money, and he was sympathetic to the workload that had been placed upon them and in fact came around to the point where he said that their sermons were not entirely dreadful, though the ministers often bewildered their congregations. Uh, Calvin actually was forced to preach more because the other preachers were so bad, he would just say, okay, you know, let me take care of this. Uh, so the training of new ministers was uh, a trial for Calvin. There's another instance of the plague in Geneva now, the plague in Geneva uh, was, of course, uh, a threat unlike we would experience in our modern day. And it was to help the sick and dying. And what the problem was, was finding ministers of courage to go and help these people when so many ministers refused because of cowardice. In fact, in 1542, a man named Pierre Blanchet, he was a man Calvin described as having a big heart, volunteered to relocate outside of the city to console and help the poor and sick. The hospital, unlike in many cities today, would be on the outskirts of the city in order to protect the people who lived in the city. And Calvin wrote to Pierre Rivet, the pestilence also begins to rage here with greater violence, and few who are at all affected by it escape its ravages. One of our colleagues was to be set apart for attendance upon the sick. Because Pierre Blanchet offered himself, all readily acquiesced. If anything happens to him, I fear that I must take the risk upon myself. For as you observe, because we are debtors to one another, 
we must not be wanting to those who, more than any others, stand in need of our ministry. That's quite a courageous spirit. In May 11th, uh, later that month, Pierre Blanchet returned to the hospital to care for the sick where he had volunteered to go, and a few weeks later, he was dead. Now, the problem was, how do they replace a man who so willingly goes to care for the sick and dying? And what they did was something most interesting that you would not suspect from Reformed people. They drew lots, and some refused because they said God had not given them the grace to undergo such a ministry. There was a man named Mathieu de Gnaston who volunteered, and he also soon died. In 1564, uh, Calvin's star student, Theodore Beza, was one who was of such theological gifting, they debated among the ministers whether he should be exempt from having to go. He's such a great theologian, why would we send such a great theologian, a great teacher, to a place where he will surely die? But in the past, Oella Campadius in Basel, Bootser in Strasbourg, Bullinger in Zurich, had visited people infected with the deadly disease. And even Calvin himself had visited people who were dying from the plague. In 1568 to 71, the plague returns to Geneva, and Beza ends up making an impassioned speech, insisting that he should be included in the lottery. He said as a minister, he had to fulfill all the duties that his office required, which included chiefly the consolation of the poor and sick people. His name was added to the lottery. It wasn't drawn out, and uh, it was later scrapped. But uh, he did visit those eventually in his parish who had been infected by the plague and other types of diseases. And Beza makes this point. It would be something very shameful, indeed wicked, to imagine a faithful pastor who abandons one of his poor sheep in the hour when he especially needs heavenly consolation. Now, these men were, uh, and I don't say this lightly, they were heroic in the conditions in which they worked. They dealt with training of ministers, they dealt with the plague, they dealt with opposition, they dealt with impurity within the church, and they also dealt with Roman Catholic opposition. Of course, we know that the Reformation was largely about the Protestants uh, protesting the abuses that were taking place in the Roman Catholic Church at the time. And there was a sort of counter-Reformation because the Reformation had become so successful in so many parts of Europe. And there was one Roman Catholic theologian called uh, Robert Bellarmine, Cardinal Bellarmine, and uh, he was responding to Protestant theology. And I wonder if anybody in here knows what he called the greatest Protestant heresy. The greatest Protestant heresy was not justification by faith alone. The greatest Protestant heresy, according to Bellarmine, as he reads the works of Calvin and others, was the doctrine of assurance. He said, how can we give people assurance that they are going to heaven? This undermines the whole purpose of the church in which they need to perform a sufficient amount of good works in order to escape the wrath to come. If you tell people that they have been justified, past tense, that they are going to heaven based upon the righteousness of Christ imputed to them, their sins are forgiven, and you give them assurance that they are as saved as they will ever be, what then will become of good works? What then will become of charity and giving and all of these things? And so a major confrontation among Catholic theologians with the Protestants was not necessarily just on the doctrine of justification, but upon what does it mean to tell people that they are going to heaven versus telling people they may go to heaven. That is why Luther reacted so violently against purgatory and indulgences, because it undermines the doctrine of justification. Of course, they debated other doctrines like uh, scripture and tradition, uh, the Mass, the Lord's Supper, pretty much anything that they could debate, they debated. And many times Calvin looked for common ground with the Catholics 
But later on in his life, he became more and more fed up with them for refusing to budge, that he became more antagonistic in his writings. Another problem that Calvin had to deal with were illnesses. Uh, they worked under strenuous conditions. You saw a book that uh, I wrote, uh, and as I wrote that book, I guarantee you I listened to many hours of YouTube music. Uh, I sat in a lovely heated room. Occasionally, my wife would even come in with a cup of coffee, and there would be times when I would look out and see the sun shining and not have to worry about people coming with swords to kill me. Uh, most of the time, I actually felt rather good physically, and uh, life was easy and good. And that may actually uh, reveal itself in the type of writing that's produced today compared to the writing that was produced back then. Uh, you see, the problem was they didn't have the laptops that we have. They didn't have the internet. Uh, often, Calvin worked from his bed, sometimes dictating commentaries by memory or sermons or whatever it was. In fact, at times he was so ill he couldn't preach. And what happens when the minister is so ill that he can't preach in Geneva? Well, he sits down and someone comes up and continues preaching from the text that the minister was preaching on. I suppose if I fell down ill, the service would be canceled and there would be a great pandemonium in the church, but there they sort of just had to get on with life. A minister's sick and falls down, who's gonna come up and preach? So with Calvin, in this type of context, um, he has terrible migraines. He suffered from pleurisy. He was room-bound in 1558 for several months. In 1559, he could hardly speak and spat blood. He suffered from hemorrhoids, gout, and in later years, kidney stones. In 1564, he wrote graphically to the physicians of Montpellier about his struggle to pass a kidney stone that lacerated his urinary canal. In fact, having listed some of his illnesses, he noted how, at present, all of these ailments, as it were, in troops assail me. I thought it might be interesting to actually describe to you him dislodging a kidney stone, uh, which would remind us of the unimaginable torments endured by our early modern forefathers. Just listen to this. At present, I am relieved from very acute suffering, having been delivered of a stone about the size of the kernel of a hazelnut. As the retention of urine was excruciating, on the advice of my physician, I mounted a horse that the jolting might assist in discharging the stone. <laughs> on my return home, I was surprised to find that I emitted discolored blood instead of urine. The following day, the stone had forced its way from the bladder into the urethra, hence still more tortures. For more than half an hour, I attempted to relieve myself by a violent agitation of my whole body. It brought nothing, but I obtained slight relief by fomentations with warm water. Meanwhile, the urinary canal was so lacerated that copious discharges of blood flowed from it. It seems to me, however, that for the past two days, I have begun to live anew since being delivered from these pains. If only Calvin had danced at the wedding. Um, he also worked himself to death. Uh, some doctors who've looked at his life and his mood swings and his temper and some of the things that he said and does seem to think that his adrenals were shot by the age of 35. But he had a phenomenal capacity for work. He preached twice every Lord's Day. Every other week he preached each morning at 6 or 7 a.m. on the Old Testament, often delivering eight sermons in a week. He preached all in all about 4,000 sermons after returning to Geneva. Some of you who know about Calvin's life know that he initially went to Geneva. They kicked him out lived a quiet scholarly life in Strasbourg, loved it, was threatened with a curse from God by his friend Farrell if he didn't return, said he would rather die than return to that city, goes back, preaches, and picks up 
years later from the exact same text that he'd been preaching on when he left. It's kind of OCD-ish, if you know what I mean. Um, but then preaching about 170 sermons each year, there were other services. He did 270 weddings, all without dancing, and 50 baptisms. In fact, Beza tells us in his Life of Calvin that the Reformer lectured every third day on theology, met with Presbytery, taught in the conference on scripture that met every Friday. If any man was ever hemmed in by sheer activity, it was John Calvin. In fact, um, it's hard to imagine the amount of work that he did as a theologian, as a churchman, as a pastor, as someone who people would be flocking to to get advice, who would be lying in bed and there would be lineups of people just trying to get a few minutes with him to ask questions about what they should do, letters coming from England and other parts of Europe about how should they respond to this crisis and that crisis. The man never had a minute to it himself, it seems. But he did have a domestic life. Uh, this is a rather amusing story, actually, and probably my favorite section. Um, during the Reformation, something incredible happened. The Reformers realized that marriage was a good thing. And there's all these priests and monks who are now single. And guess what? there's all these nuns who become Protestants who are single, and you have a whole bunch of priests and monks and a whole bunch of nuns, and it's a recipe for absolute mayhem. Now, he's a young, single reformer. What does he do? Well, Calvin, it, it seems, did not struggle with um, great lusts and sexual temptations, if he is to be believed. In fact, he says, I have never married before he got married, and I do not know whether I ever will. If I do it, it will be in order to be freer from many daily troubles and thus freer for the Lord. Lack of sexual continence would not be the reason I would point to for marrying. No one can charge me with that. Uh, but Calvin's friends loved to play matchmaker for Calvin and others. Uh, and Martin Bootser, Calvin's dear friend, tried to find Calvin a wife. And Calvin ended up getting very frustrated with his friends because of the various ladies that were coming into his life as potential wives. In fact, Calvin says, I am not one of those insane kind of lovers who, once smitten by the first glance of a fine figure, cherishes even the faults of his lover. The only beauty that seduces me is one who is chaste, not too fastidious, modest, thrifty, patient, and hopefully she will be attentive to my health. Uh, the woman that Bootser had in mind after Calvin wrote that to him ended up vanishing, surprisingly. Um, another woman was offered to Calvin who had a considerable dowry, uh, and she was offered to Calvin, and Calvin makes this comment on this matchmaking. The relatives of that young lady of high rank are so determined that I take her to myself. I could not think of ever doing this unless the Lord has altogether demented me. I don't know what she was like. That does seem a little bit harsh. <laughs> Eventually, he fell in love with Idolette de Burge, who was the widow of an Anabaptist. And what we know of Calvin's marriage is that he cherished his wife, actually had a very happy marriage, a lot of sadness in their marriage uh, with the death of children, but uh, when you read the relationship between Calvin and how he speaks affectionately of his wife, all of those comments before seem to uh, show a man who didn't really ever understand the glories of marriage and so basically spoke as one who was ignorant. Uh, but you see the way in which he reflects upon his marriage and uh, how he cherished her. And they, in fact, they had a nice honeymoon, but it was cut short by the plague. Um, <laughs> can you imagine? We're off to Mexico, and the plague breaks out. Well, that's early modern life. There's also what has been known as the Servetus Affair. Most of you in here may have heard at some point in your life, if you've heard of Calvin, that he killed a guy called Michael Servetus. 
Um, now, it's an interesting backstory because in 1534, Calvin had actually gone to Paris to meet Servetus, and in doing so, risked his life in order to meet with Servetus. Now, Servetus was a heretic. There's no question about that if you judge Christian orthodoxy. And heresy in the early modern world was not just bad theology. It was a political danger and a moral monstrosity. And if Protestants and Catholics agreed on anything, it was that heretics had to be punished. They could not be tolerated. In fact, the Roman Catholic Church burned an effigy of Servetus as a sort of symbolic killing of him because he had escaped from their grips. Now, Servetus was publicly known as a heretic, and in 1553, he appears in Geneva at a church service where Calvin was preaching. Uh, scholars believe that Servetus basically stalked Calvin. There was no Facebook block button, so uh, Servetus had to rock up at church, and that is what he did. And he claimed that he was merely on his way to Naples. He was coming from near Lyon in France, and anyone who does a bit of geography realizes that he clearly went out of his way to find Calvin. Now, Servetus was actually detained once they found out that he was in Geneva, and they asked Calvin, the consistory and the council, to draw up a list of charges on Servetus's life and teachings. Now, Calvin had a private secretary, and what ended up happening is that when Servetus was placed in jail, while Calvin was writing up the charges against Servetus, Calvin's secretary had to go into jail as well as a sort of bond. Now, after he'd written up the charges and the council had agreed that they were uh, condemning of Servetus, his secretary was allowed to leave. Now, heresy was a capital offense. And in fact, Calvin did not want Servetus to die. Some of Calvin's contemporaries, like Heinrich Bullinger uh, in Zurich, uh, called Servetus a demon from hell. The Jevan, Genevan church had to deal with Servetus because everybody knew he'd been detained there the Catholic Church was watching, what are the Protestants going to do? Other Protestant cities and villages are saying, what is Geneva going to do? And it would have been suicide, theological suicide at the time, for Geneva to tolerate Servetus because it would have thrown the whole Protestant movement into disrepute because they are allowing heresy to flourish. It would have been a great argument against Protestantism if Servetus had not been condemned. So the council, not Calvin, condemned Servetus to die. And there were two teachings of Servetus that were uh, drawn out as the reasons why he should die. And some of you might find this a little bit amusing. But uh, the first was on the Trinity. He denied the Trinity. And that makes sense. Uh, you deny the Trinity, you're a heretic. The other teaching that led him to be condemned to die was the fact that he rejected infant baptism. Um, that was quite a charge back then. Uh, so Servetus is condemned to die, and those were described as his most pernicious errors. And Calvin wanted Servetus to die by the sword, uh, but he did not get his way. He went to Servetus and asked for him to recant, but Servetus would not recant, and he ended up then being condemned to die by flames. It was a victory for Servetus over Calvin that Servetus would not give up his aberrant views on the Trinity. These are some of the struggles that Calvin had to deal with in Geneva. But the hardest thing about Calvin's struggles, I think, and again, now perhaps I'm speaking as a pastor, were the struggles in his own local church getting the Genevan people to believe the gospel. For all of the illnesses that he had to endure, for all the attacks from people qualifying that his theology was wrong and, and heretical, uh, for all of the problems he had in finding a wife, for all of the problems he had in all manner of dealing with uninformed ministers, nothing was more difficult for Calvin than getting the people in his church to believe the gospel. He had rebellious people in his church, people who 
merely showed up but did not wish to listen. And Calvin's great burden was preaching the gospel. He believed that if he simply preached God's word, it would do its work. In fact, the most important thing anyone could do in Geneva was simply attend church and worship God purely and sincerely on the Lord's Day, be fed by God, and that would sort out the majority of their problems. But he had um, some rebellious young men, and he's preaching through Job in his congregation, and he calls them petite ordures, which is little pieces of garbage. Uh, and so he's saying to them, you know, these young men, he's calling them out. And there's other people who are falling asleep. And there are other people who are not even paying attention. And there's other people who heckle the preacher. They would sometimes have to deal with fruit and, and other things being thrown at them. And people would come out of services and they'd be like, what did you learn? And they'd say, we have no idea what was going on in there. You see, Reformation as far as Calvin was concerned, as far as Luther's concerned, as far as any minister's concerned, is not something that happens overnight. It takes years and years and years of faithful preaching. And Calvin put his trust in the fact that God's word would accomplish what God's word is alone able to do. He was merely an organ, an instrument used by God to fill God's people with God's truth, but the hardest struggle he had was getting people who had been so immersed in Roman Catholic dogma to believe that God justifies you freely in this life apart from works. He was trying to take people who their whole life had saved up all their excess money to buy their way out of purgatory. People who had believed that if they just did this or that, there might be hope for them in the life to come. And he has to do a complete 180 in their thinking and get them to believe that God justifies the wicked, that God saves you and grants to you assurance that you are a child of God. Nothing, I think, was more difficult for Calvin than getting his people to believe the gospel. And I would say over the last 500 years, nothing has been more difficult for every minister of the gospel than getting the people who sit under faithful preaching to believe in the freeness, in the grace of the gospel and what that means. And that is why the Reformation will always, always be an ongoing activity until Christ returns. Because God's way of salvation cuts so against the grain of how we are constituted as human beings that it takes many, many years for people to finally get it. And so you have the 10 points of Calvinism, Calvin's struggles in Geneva. Well, time for questions, if there are any. Raise your hand if you have a question for Dr. Jones, and we'll come to you with a microphone. Dr. Jones, uh, a question I have. You told us some interesting anecdotes from Calvin's life, things that probably many haven't heard. What's another uh, interesting uh, bit or uh, anecdote or episode from Calvin's life that might uh, surprise the students, interest them? Uh, well, I kind of like the fact that part of his salary was getting paid in wine. <laughs> <laughs> I, as a Presbyterian, uh, wish my own elders paid me <laughs> in wine. Uh, and, you know, you look, at, you look at his life and the things that he uh, enjoyed. And, you know, he, he saw a lot of beauty in God's creation, but also in the gifts that God gave. And, and the Reformation was really a whole host of things. You can't say it was about this or that. It was about a whole world's view and, and recapturing God's good gifts to us. And I kind of like um, to see the side of Calvin where a lot of people think of him as this sort of dark, shadowy, difficult personality. But, you know, I think he, he really did enjoy a good time at the appropriate time. I just He just didn't have enough time on his hands to have too many good times. 
So I suppose our great service to Calvin as heirs of him would be to make up for what he missed out on. <laughs> Anyone have a question? There's a hand. Did did any of Calvin's contemporaries uh, view him as tyrannical in his approach to reforming? Well, that was a that was a, a charge. It you know contemporaries in terms of there were a lot of contemporaries who disagreed with Calvin, who were obviously Catholics uh, and Protestants. Uh, most of the contemporaries who thought he was tyrannical in his approach were the people where he, you know, would say, you, you, you can't dance at a wedding or um, you wicked, evil people. Like, he had a pretty high view of the Christian life and godliness and you know, we debate things as Christians today like, should Christians watch Game of Thrones? Well, you know, Calvin, like, that wouldn't even enter into his thinking. It's, uh, so you, you look at some of the issues he deals with and, and what he would say is godlessness. And it was pretty strict. Um, you know, I've done a bit of studies in the Puritans and some of the things they found um, to be less than appropriate. And, I mean, it's it's pretty strict. So, I mean... Tyrannical would probably be more reserved for the libertines, people who he forbade from coming to the Lord's Supper. But most of his contemporaries who were Protestant reformers were pretty much of the same view as him on those types of things that, you know, I guess a lot of us here wouldn't flinch to hear about dancing at a wedding, but that's just like a big no-no. So it, mainly it were people who wanted to undermine the Reformation not so much his contemporaries in terms of their friends. They were all pretty much staunchly against any sort of things like that. All right, I got one. Um, most people in this room, if they're going to hear of him, they're either gonna hear, like you said about uh, the death of Servetus. Um, the other probably big thing that if you're thinking of Calvin that you're going to you're going to know about, probably have disagreements with, is his theology of predestination and election. Is that something that's remarkable? Is that something he invents? Uh, uh, something that we should all be scared of? Yeah. Um, you know, how, how do we appropriate Calvin along those lines? Yeah, if you look at his institutes of Christian religion, predestination really doesn't, you know, become a, a big issue to well, well, well into the, the four books. Uh, he's it's almost like he doesn't really deal with it that much in the institutes, and then it comes up in his commentaries, but he doesn't understand himself to be saying really anything different than the received opinion of the church. In fact, Calvin did his best to be unoriginal, and by that, every time he debated with Roman Catholics, and at, he sought to find common ground with the church in terms of what had been handed down to him, you know, basically from Augustine onwards especially, he would locate his theology in that sort of Augustinian tradition. And uh, the first generation reformers before him had basically said the same types of things. Um, and all over the map, the Protestants were of one mind on that thing. You see, the issue with predestination is, is it's kind of simple in one respect. The word is in the Bible. So you've got to affirm it if you're a Bible believer. The question is, what do you mean by it and how does it, how does it work? And it was really after Calvin's time where you saw Protestants, especially with the Remonstrants, Arminius, start to fight back. But even if you look at the Roman Catholic tradition, the Dominicans uh, were basically of the same view on that as Calvin. The Jesuits uh, at times could be a little bit different uh, but generally, even in the Catholic Church, the majority of them wouldn't have really disagreed with Calvin on things like predestination. So it, it, it wasn't really a big deal so much. Expanding upon that a little bit, could you speak a little bit into the aspect of irresistible grace? Um, 
obviously something that Calvin taught on and believed greatly, um, and how we can reconcile and understand that to the character of God. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> um, the, what we're finding out in Reformed theology now is that the Reformed theologians had a very robust doctrine of the freedom of the will and human actions and, and you know, the idea of robots and, and, you know, God just pulling us like puppets is, is thoroughly discounted in, in scholarship. And you look at the way Calvin in his commentaries and in his preaching and how he deals with individuals, um, the real issue for Calvin and, and his contemporaries was simply this. If people are truly dead in their sins, why do some believe and not others? Um, you either have two options as far as Calvin's concerned. Some people are simply more aware and make a decision upon which they see it is better for them to believe, and it's purely of themselves, and then they receive grace as a result of this decision, or God, by the mysterious work of the Holy Spirit, so uses the word of God, and Calvin believed very strongly in the fact that the word of God has to be preached for the spirit to work in co connection with that. The word of God would become alive in someone's soul because of the work of the Holy Spirit opening their eyes to see the truth. So the reason why some believe and some don't is down to the work of the Holy Spirit. As far as Calvin believed, the other option was to say that God had looked into the future, a type of Molinist. Uh, there was a Jesuit theologian Molina, who had a kind of a doctrine where God would look into the future, see who believes, then give them, predestine them, and give them grace. So it was ultimately either down to a human response or God's secret work. Um, that's just, those are the two major views. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that... Uh, he was called the theologian of the Holy Spirit, Calvin, um, which is, is interesting. Because um, a lot of people, again, focus on things like predestination, sovereignty of God, but Calvin really was known for his work on the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, so I have a question on infant baptism. So obviously it was a really big deal back when Calvin was alive. So today, do you think it still applies, or do you think there's really nothing to it? <laughs> or yeah. Well, I mean, <clears throat> it, it's... He opens his account, speaking about baptism, it's, it's just kind of funny because he says, in this age, certain frenzied spirits have raised and continue to raise great disturbance in the church on account of infant baptism. I cannot avoid here by way of appendix adding something to restrain their fury. Like, that's just awesome. Uh, you know, so he, he to him, it's abs he's absolutely convinced. And that's because as a reformer, they really believed that if the Catholics were ever right, they wanted to affirm. They didn't want to drift from the church unless they felt they absolutely needed to. Now, others came along, Anabaptists, and felt that further reformation was needed and they needed to depart on that point. Um, Calvin today, like, if Calvin were alive today, this is just me thinking, hopefully with a bit of sanctified imagination, if he were alive today and heard of Calvinistic Baptists, he would probably freak out. I don't freak out. They're my friends. I mean, I like Ian most of the time. And <laughs> it's to us not really a shock. But in Geneva at that time, um, it was a big deal to, to reject what they said is the commonly received doctrine of the church. Um, so yeah, things are really different today, even in terms of how we tolerate each other. And I think I'm personally quite happy with the degree of toleration we have uh, today, but back then it, it just you, just wasn't an option to be a Baptist in Geneva. Um, and do I think it's legit today? Well, I hope so. I baptized my children, so um, I'll find out in heaven. <laughs> Ian already knows the answer, but I'm waiting to wait till <laughs> heaven, right? You just never listen. <laughs> yeah. Questions more? Should we we go with John? Do you think? So I know Luther had some major disagreements with Calvin. What were the major things that they disagreed with that 
kind of split them into different denominations. Yeah, they had differences on worship. Uh, they had differences on the Lord's Supper especially. That was a major point. Calvin was much more willing to compromise what he thought was biblical compromise than Luther was. Luther was a jerk sometimes. Uh, I mean, he was as stubborn as they get. Whereas Calvin would even say nice things about Zwingli, which Luther just thought Zwingli was of another spirit. He even said that to Zwingli to his face. Um, so Calvin, I think, was trying to unite the Protestants. And you know, he was, he was later than Luther. I mean, they were still contemporaries, but a little bit later, and saw things a bit differently. So worship, sacraments. Um, there would be other areas where Calvin was probably clarifying a bit with Luther, but they, they, I think, by and large, were in a lot of agreement. Um, he called him his you know, spiritual father and had a great deal of deference to Luther. Luther was known as the guy you, you really owe a lot of respect to. So when even if Calvin had certain disagreements with Luther, they would be m tempered, ex extremely tempered, uh, because of a respect issue. And so Calvin dealt mainly with Melanchthon who um, they were much even closer together in doctrine. So th yeah, the Lord's Supper is the big obvious one. Uh, and that one, that was always gonna be, a, a, for the Protestants, their major dividing point. We have time for two more questions. Now's your chance. Um, so how did, uh, with, with Calvin, the, the bigger name reformers or Calvinists of our day, how did we get from someone who seemed so sturdy and hard and not fun to, to uh, the big name guys like John Piper and other people today who affirm that, that the reformation or the reformed uh, theology and Calvin theology uh, kind of leads to Christian hedonism or Christian enjoyment pleasure how did we get from someone who was so, you know, not pleasurable to a, a <laughs> theology that is a big emphasis in, like, pleasure and enjoyment? Yeah, let me, I mean, I gave you some of the stories, but again, like, everything is historically located in a time and era where Calvin appreciated beauty, and, and you see him write on, on things like he loved, it's just, he was leading a reformation and he was sick all of the time. Like, I'm pretty grumpy when I'm sick. You're a guy, man colds, you know? <laughs> We're babies. Um, he, he's got, he's being attacked spiritually, physically at times. It's kind of like you just got to read his life and be like, okay, I'll throw you a bone that you weren't always, you know, jumping around saying, oh, uh, God is just so glorified in me because I'm so satisfied in him. Like. <laughs> John Viper lives in Minneapolis in the 21st century. Uh, he sits on a toilet that flushes. <laughs> he doesn't go out and dig a hole and, well, I don't think he does. Um, <laughs> but you know, like you've got to kind of take into account um, where people are at when they lived. And, and I think it's just a blessing God has given us in this age where we're able to um, stand on their shoulders all the work they did and with a great degree of freedom and liberty enjoy a lot of things but I'll be I'll, I'll be honest I sometimes do wonder if we haven't maybe become a little excessive in our liberties with the things we enjoy and watch and and some of the time we waste you know you look at Calvin's life there was it wasn't a wasted life and God has honored him through the ages because of that whereas you know look how much time we waste on social media and and television shows that aren't exactly edifying. Um, so yeah, I'm, I, I don't wanna be too hard on him and I also think it's a good time for us to examine our own lives and the things we count valuable. But yeah, he could be pretty grumpy. <laughs> Anyone have a final question? Well, since I don't see a hand, Dr. Jones, you want to give us a final word as, as, as the students uh, prepare to go out into the night. What do you want to leave them with? Uh, what's your final word about John Calvin? Um, well, uh, John Calvin is in heaven. <laughs> and 
I think that's kind of important because uh, he knew he was going to heaven. And I think he would want everyone here to have that same belief before they die and while they're living that I am going to heaven. And I think if we can take anything from Calvin, it was that he sought to give people the assurance that God's grace really is God's grace. And it should give you a confidence before God that you are his child and that you are going to heaven. And people who like Calvin understand that in the context of the local church, because the church is our mother, if God is our father, um, I think that's really the most important thing we can take from his life is that Calvin is in heaven and we will be there with him one day. Before we uh, thank Dr. Uh, Jones, uh, in just a moment, Dr. Clary, would you close us in prayer? And then just a reminder to the pastors that are here, don't leave right away. Come up front, and we've got a gift of Dr. Jones's newest book for you. You can sign it for you if you'd like. And, uh, but in a moment, we'll thank Dr. Jones. But first, Dr. Clary, would you lead us in a closing prayer? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you're the God of history. Uh, you're a God who is deeply concerned with the goings-on of this world. And uh, you orchestrate things to your ends and for your glory. Lord, we thank you that you raise up men and women uh, like a Calvin uh, who will take firm stands on the gospel, won't waste a minute of their lives uh, before your face. Lord, thank you that we can spend an hour uh, thinking about a man like this that you have called. Uh, Lord, I pray that he would function in our lives as a great model and example of the Christian life, uh, that you would help us uh, to want to emulate his faith as he is emulating Christ. Lord, we thank you for all of the students here. <clears throat> thank you for Dr. Jones and him coming to take the time to share these thoughts with us. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would be glorified for Christ's sake. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Jones. You are dismissed.